thank you. Well, my thanks to Desvina Sabataku for um, inviting me to present this seminar. And in doing so, I should also thank the archaeology department for hosting me and so forth. And I have an apology to make. I've realised rather belatedly that it's impossible to give a view of the Holy Aegean Bronze Age in an hour. There's just too much to be said. So although many fascinating developments took, part in, took place in various parts of the Aegean, during the Bronze Age, I shall concentrate on what is clearly the most important story, the rise and fall of the Minoan civilization based in Crete and of the Mycenaean civilization that developed on the Greek mainland and succeeded the Minoan. Even doing this will require more than one hour. So I've decided to break at the Big Bang, the eruption of Santorini, which may be described as the only certified historical event of the Aegean Bronze Age, which may have had a major effect on historical development through its effect on Minoan and Crete. If one accepts Colin Renfrew's suggestion that a civilization should have at least two out of three features, towns of more than 5,000 inhabitants, a system of writing and monumental ceremonial centers, then Minoan civilization certainly fits these criteria, and the Mycenaean at its height may well do. Although they are overall less impressive than those of Egypt and the Near East, this is more than can be found anywhere else in Europe at this time. Also, some of what has been discovered in excavations is spectacular in its own right, to a degree that might have been surprising to the historical Greeks who were in awe of the great civilizations of their neighbors in Asia and Egypt, and only preserved dim memories of a legendary past of greatness, the so-called heroic age. In fact, the Greeks had no idea of the length of their prehistoric past, nor of its nature, and they would have been very surprised to learn that the first foundation of civilization in Greece was not the work of Greek speakers. For they imagined that their various groupings had always lived in Greece or very near it, and only moved around within the mainland of the Aegean, although some of their heroes were claimed to be foreign, from Asia Minor, Phoenicia, or Egypt. The notion of a coming of the Greeks which brought a people speaking the Indo-European ancestor of later Greek from a distant source to the Greek mainland about 2000 BC to overwhelm and absorb the previous communities has no basis in ancient tradition, but is a totally modern theory. The arguments for it from archeology span no longer seem very convincing. And in my opinion, we just don't know how Greek came to be the dominant language, first of the southern mainland, then of most of the Aegean. But very few of the place names of historical Greece mean anything in Greek. So there must have been people speaking other languages there first, whose place names were adopted, probably adapted, by later comers. Just to make sure where that everyone knows where I'm talking about, I shall use this slide. Oh, I've lost things on the right-hand side. Oh. Um, I can move them. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Kala. <laughs> and since the uh, supplied pointer doesn't work, I shall have to use my finger. <laughs> this is the best uh, map I can use, in fact. Um, I must apologize for the quality of some of these slides, which I've been desperately scanning from various sources, but um, I thought it best to point out 
the major names that I shall be using, citing in both the English forms that I am so used to because I grew up with them, and in Greek to show how different the Greek forms are from the English pronunciations, and I hope I shall pronounce them all correctly. So, this is the Aegean Sea, Aeo. And these are the islands called the Cyclades, Kiklades. <laughs> and note Santorini down here, and also Kea and Naxos, which I shall be referring to in the course of the event of this um, lecture. From Mycenae, of course, comes Mycenaean, Mykinaikos. Down here is Mycenae with Pylos, Greek Pylos, and next to it, Laconia, Laconia, which is where the historical Spartans lived. Going north of the Peloponnese, I note an Aeina, important island. Athens is about there. And then you come to Thebes, Theva, and off about there, Ochomonos, which are the two great um, centers of Boeotia, Viotia. And alongside the island of Euboea, Evia, and furthest north in the what historical Greeks considered to be Greek on the mainland, Thessaly, Thessalia. Down here, of course, we have Crete, Crete, and the three major centers are helpfully put on the map. Knossos in Greek, Knossos, Festos in Greek, Festos, and Malia. As you see, there are plenty of other important places too. Finally, um, to the east of the Aegean is Anatolia, Anatolia, generally uh, quite often in any sources you might read referred to as Asia Minor. And off the map to the north is Troy, Tria, also called Ilios in the Homeric poems and Ilion in classical times. And finally, Miletus, another place I may well have occasion to mention, though I think not this rhyme. So, I came to Greek archaeology through fascination with the Greek myths as a boy. And I was very struck by the discovery from Robert Graves's Penguin publication, The Greek Myths, that there actually existed a list of names of the leaders and their contingents of the, of the Greeks that fought at the Trojan War. Though so this is the well-known catalogue of ships in book two of the Iliad. So when I started on a classics degree in Oxford in 1960, I was a natural for the Homeric archaeology course that was taught by Dorothea Gray, a noted expert at that time. This gave me a scepticism which has never left me about the supposed reality of the Trojan War and the belief common then that the epic tradition to which the Iliad and Odyssey belonged preserved genuine memories of the Mycenaean past. In fact, I now refuse to believe that there ever was a Trojan War like that envisaged in Greek tradition. After my BA, I went on to conduct doctoral research in um, Greek prehistory, presenting a thesis on the origins of Mycenaean civilization in 1970. And I made the study of Greek prehistory the focus of my academic career with a special emphasis on the mainland. For a long time, Minoan Crete was a rather mysterious great power hovering on the edge of my knowledge, much like how it might have appeared to its Aegean neighbors in the Bronze Age.
But when I started to write the Aegean Bronze Age, I had to learn about it properly. And I have tried to keep up, though it's harder in retirement. I should take a little time to show how the prehistoric past of Greece became known in modern times. Although finds had been made here and there, which seemed to predate anything belonging to Greece's historical period, the first really major finds were made by Heinrich Schliemann in the excavations that he conducted at Mycenae of material that belongs to the late Bronze Age, roughly the 16th to 12th centuries BC, of which the most spectacular part, Ella. <laughs> the most spectacular part is the grave circle, the so-called shaft graves, which is the source of the famous mask, the best of the five that were found and is often called the mask of Agamemnon, though my own research has shown that this was not originally the face that Schliemann thought was Agamemnon, because Schliemann, of course, believed these burials that he'd found were the burials of Agamemnon and his followers, murdered by Aesops and Clytemnestra after their return from Troy. Studying these graves was a major part of my doctoral research, like everyone else, I imagined that Schliemann's account of the excavation in times was accurate. But recently it has become clear from the rediscovery of the reports of Panagiotis Stamatakis, the archaeologist sent from Athens to supervise Schliemann, that Stamatakis was the day-to-day -day careful excavator and note-taker, while Schliemann made many mistakes in his account and grabbed all the glory completely suppressing Stamatakis' contribution, as he had done with Frank Calvert, his collaborator at Troy. If anyone still thinks of him as the father of Greek prehistoric archaeology, he does not deserve the title. The true father was Christos Tsundas, who excavated for many years at Mycenae and produced a balanced account of the finds that have been made mostly on the mainland, to define what he called the Mycenaean civilization after its greatest center, and which he related to the picture of the heroic age found in the Homeric poems. A very active archaeologist, he also laid the foundations of pre-Mycenaean archaeology in the Aegean, excavating many cemeteries that proved to be early Bronze Age in the Cyclades. He also dug the important Neolithic sites of Sesclo and Dimini in Thessaly. But the really crucial development was when Arthur Evans, who had traveled in Crete in search of ancient writing, began excavations at Knossos in March 1900. Here, part of a major building attributable to Mycenaean times had already been unearthed by the appropriately named Minos Kalokerinos, in 1878. With the invaluable assistance of Duncan Mackenzie, an experienced archaeologist, Evans quickly uncovered remains of a palace, what he called a palace at any rate, which was far more splendid than anything at Mycenae or Tyrians, where Schliemann had excavated the whole upper citadel, and which produced plenty of evidence for writing. This is a linear B tablet, it is not one from Knossos, but rather Pylos, but it's the best um, picture I can show you. He also found remains of older structures below the Mycenaean level, proving the greater antiquity of civilization in Crete. Evans's lasting contribution to Aegean archaeology, apart from this, was the system that he devised and published in 1906 for ordering the phases of prehistoric development in Crete on the basis of his and other excavated material. He adopted the term Minoan, taken from the legendary King Minos, to cover the Bronze Age, which he 
divided into three major stages, early, middle, and late, subdividing each of these into three. And this was meant to run more or less contemporaneously with the already established Egyptian system of old, middle, and new kingdom. This became the template for the Holy Geon. So as you see on this, there were comparable sequences of Cyclavic and the mainland Helladic was the term co coined for the, you, the referring to the mainland. And the later, latest part of that, of course, is the Mycenaean. There are all sorts of problems with this system. But it is what you will encounter in common use in general books and specialist studies, with many subdivisions, as you can see, introduced to reflect the major changes in material, especially fine pottery, that have formed the basis for a detailed relative chronology. Evans developed a view that the Minoan civilization of Crete had dominated the whole Aegean region and that the Mycenaean civilization on the mainland was simply a provincial version developed by Minoan conquerors and colonists. Although very influential, this idea was increasingly opposed by those who specialized in mainland prehistory, particularly Alan Wace, who excavated further at Mycenae, and Carl Blagan, who excavated a site that had a stratigraphic record covering all three stages of the Bronze Age at Kuraku, near Corinth, published in 1921. They argued that the Mycenaean civilization developed independently of, if much influenced by, the Minoan. The evidence of Sorry, but the evidence of stratigraphy at Mycenae proved that the most impressive finds, the great, greatest Tholos tombs and the massive fortifications, here you see up on the right the Lion Gate, this is the bastion thrown out beyond it, um, these were later than the great days of Minoan civilization. There was a tremendous controversy after this, but it was not until Michael Ventris suggested in 1952 that the Linear B script, which was that of the majority of written tablets found at Knossos, also at the Palace of Pylos that Blagan was excavating, could be read as Greek. And that meant that Evans was finally proved wrong. Weiss, in fact, suggested that the final phase of the Palace of Knossos was dominated by a Mycenaean Greek-speaking elite, which led easily enough to theories that the Mycenaeans had conquered Crete, in keeping with the picture of Mycenaean civilization as warlike, that could be derived from accepting that the picture of the Greek heroes presented in the Iliad depicted the Mycenaean elite. Evans had been proved wrong about the nature of Mycenaean civilization, but he was right about one thing, the greatness and importance of development in the Aegean of the Minoan civilization. Here I should make a point of terminology. From Evans onward, it has been common to speak of the inhabitants of Bronze Age Crete as Minoans, and the late Bronze Age inhabitants of the Helladic region of the mainland as Mycenaeans in a way that treats them as if they were ethnic groups. But these were not ancient peoples in the way that the Assyrians or Hittites or uh, Egyptians could be described as such. They are modern labels, referring to associations of archaeological characteristics that used to be called cultures. We have no reason to suppose that all those who shared the archaeological characteristics, or most of them, recognized themselves as one people or spoke the same language. Still less is it necessary to believe that when some typical Minoan or Mycenaean characteristic, most often pottery, appears in the archaeological record at a site 
which previously had a totally local association of features, that actual people from Crete or the Helladic region had settled at that site. There are cases where there does seem to have been some kind of colonization. For example, on the island of Kythera, south of Laconia, and also perhaps in the Dodecanese and at Miletus in Anatolia, there does seem to have been some Minoan or complete Minoanization. But the evidence of what is called Minoanization in the well known Cyclonic islands, Thera, Milos, Naxos, Kea, more probably represents a wish of at least some community leaders to assimilate to the dominant culture of the Aegean, even maybe to proclaim acceptance of some of its beliefs. And sometimes it will reflect no more than the adoption of useful domestic items developed in Crete, such as specialized cooking apparatus, braziers, and lamp. But I shall continue to use the term Minoans because it is useful shorthand for the Cretans in the Bronze Age, without wanting it to be understood as referring to a single people, let alone inhabitants of a single state, as Evans wanted to believe. The roots of development in the Aegean, in Crete as elsewhere, can be identified in the early Bronze Age, by which time Crete and the mainland had been occupied by farming communities for millennia. Though many of the smaller islands were not generally were not permanently occupied until this time, after 3000 BC about. The populations of the various communities lived in villages of varying size generally, and they were the inheritors of a well-established farming economy adapted to the local climate. Growing varieties of wheat, barley and pulses, breeding sheep, goats, cattle and pigs, and practicing a variety of crafts using stone, bone and clay. Pottery making being a universal feature. There was some metalworking, but this became much more prominent in the early Bronze Age when useful implements became quite common, as well as ornaments, and rarely vessels and weapons. Other introductions in the early Bronze Age were the olive, the vine may already have begun to be cultivated and the fig would come later, and the indispensable beast of burden the donkey. Horses do not seem to have been introduced until much later. The new introductions were the latest examples of an absolutely basic feature of Aegean prehistory, the movement of explorers and traders and the passing on of all kinds of information by sea. Paddling boats or canoe-like craft, because sails had not been developed at this stage. But this, this is a late early Bronze Age um, uh, decoration of a strange shape known as a frying pan, and it's on the base. And you see here a cycladic longboat. And these seem to have been uh, very important in moving things around at that time. This Movements by sea and exchange of materials, information, etc., goes back far into the pre Bronze Age past. Obsidian from the island of Milos was reaching the Frank V cave, F R A N C H T H I, in the southern Argolid in the Mesolithic period, if not earlier. And the community that lived at the cave were fishing for tuna and other deep sea fish by this time as a major part of their diet. The first farming settlers must have arrived in Crete by sea, perhaps using great rafts in which to transport breeding populations of domestic livestock. And this is thought likely that the new settlers in Thessaly, where there are some other very early um, Neolithic settlements, in both cases we're talking around 7000 BC or so, um, the, that they arrived the same way. 
These people, though, evidently maintained maritime contacts with their original homes and probably with other communities in the Aegean, so that Milo, uh, obsidian from Milos got passed all the way around the Aegean. And innovations in technologies like pottery making could come ultimately from Asia Minor, and they in turn have got them from the Near Eastern civilization. Of course, there was plenty of time for these contacts to be made and for innovations to spread. The so-called final Neolithic period in the Aegean seems to have lasted for something like a millennium, and the first stage of the early Bronze Age for several centuries. Although the archaeological record for at least part of this long period is rather indistinct in much of the mainland, and is largely confined to cemeteries rather than settlement sites in the Cyclades, in Crete, the evidence very much reflects a pattern of growth of population. Knossos and Festos were already large settlements with populations that should have been at least several hundreds by the end of the Neolithic. And it is striking that at both, there are already signs of the establishment of some kind of courtyard area where the later palaces had their central courts. This feature has now been identified in so many major buildings, Bronze Age buildings in Crete, that it's been suggested that the term palace, which inevitably conjures up the idea of monarchs and centers of government, should be abandoned for the much less loaded court-centered building. It certainly seems that such courtyards reflect a pronounced liking for communal activity of a ceremonial and ritual type as is very apparent in later Minoan phases. In many parts of Crete, there was a well-established practice of using large stone-built tombs over long periods to hold many burials. In South Crete, the dominant type was circular. As you see here, this is a place Platonos has got several of them. And in the east, there were groups of rectilinear buildings that might sometimes resemble houses. While at a site, important site south of Knossos, Archanes, these are the ones that matter, there were both types. And um, it, there seems to have been almost a competition between groups using the different buildings to make them seem more important. And there's at least one which, um, this tomb B, which uh, seems to combine the two. These were not the only forms of burial represented in Crete, and the variety suggests notable differences between the populations in different parts, but they do seem to reflect a very widespread belief about the importance of recognizing membership of a group like a family or a clan and keeping them together even in death. Some tombs, especially in South Crete, remained in use for very long periods extending into the Middle Bronze Age, before they were finally abandoned. Although some tomb types at particular sites on the mainland were used <clears throat> in the same way for a series of burials, they never covered very extensive periods of time. And cyclonic tombs, normally small box-like structures of stone, rarely held more than single burials. So the great communal tombs of Crete form one of the many signs of Cretan distinctiveness. The individual histories of slides in Crete, site, sorry, sites in Crete varied over the centuries of the early Bronze Age. And there are possible indications of conflict and concern with defense at some sites. But the overall impression is of continued growth. And the largest centers like Knossos became very big by comparison with anything that had gone before. By the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, Knossos is thought to the population to have been between somewhere 6,000 and 11,000. Festos, 7,500 to, to 10,000, and Malia, over 5,000. In this respect, there is a particularly marked contrast with other parts of the Aegean. 
The vibrant early Bronze Age culture of the Cyclades, well known for its marble figurines, you see many examples of the so-called folded arm figurine type, and other stonework, these all disappeared. And the signs of social development on the mainland suggested by the corridor houses of which this house of the tiles is that was the first known example, although as you can see, I hope, building BG under it was already of this type. This and the find within it of these clay ceilings, i.e. pieces of clay that had been stamped with some kind of seal, as you see here, uh, you can get uh, lots of different stamps even on one piece. And these were applied to containers of um, the lids of con uh, jars containing something, to doors to see who was going into a room or not, because you would have to break the um, seal to do so, and um, all that kind of thing. They're in fact an administrative tool. These are both first identified at Lerner, that you see down here. You see a close up of the whole Argolid area. But they've now been found at many different sites. The corridor houses are more uh, widespread, but ceilings have been found at all sorts of sites on the Greek mainland. Other areas use, seem to have had seals, but they never used them like this, as far as we know. Anyway, these both disappeared um, in what seems to be a serious recession marked by site destructions and abandonments that may have been caused ultimately by a late third millennium worsening of the climate, which has been identified in the Near East. And there was a general reversion to village culture. Though a colonna on Aeina, a fortified town continued to exist with an unimpressive but large, long central building. And this town can, um, maintains regular contact with similar towns that were developing on the Cycladic Islands, generally only one or two to an island and obviously containing most of the population. And Aina not only ha maintained these Cycladic connections, but distributed its fine pottery of, um, along many sites on the eastern side of the mainland, as if its traders were going around collecting whatever there was to pick up there and um, leaving their pottery behind. In fact, pottery evidence uh, at this time suggests there was a good deal of exchange at a low level in much of the Aegean. There's some examples. This is an example of the famous Grey Minion ware, um, it's on a, a particularly distinctive shape, the um, ring-stemmed goblet, which um, was so popular in the islands that they sometimes copied it in their own ware. And here is a rather more interesting piece, a barrel jar of uh, um, found on Egina, which it's interesting because it shows boats. And uh, these boats clearly have masts. And obviously they were a way for these traders and such like to get around and possibly also um, pay unwelcome visits. Only in Crete, though, is there a clear sign of contact further afield with Egypt, Cyprus and Syria. And the receipt of influences from these re civilized regions. And development, though, was such that in the early Middle Bronze Age, probably after 2000 BC, the first palace or proto-palatial period was initiated by the construction of the major architectural complexes called palaces at Knossos, Festos, and Malia, always around a central court and with very um, similar plans. These seem to have been centers for large-scale ceremonies and feasting, storage, 
perhaps superior craftwork and administration. Perhaps only of the palace's affairs and workforce originally, but using the help of writing and seals. Two different, if related, scripts were in use. And the um, the tablet that I showed you earlier is a good example of one way they were they were just written on these rectangular slabs of clay, and these um, were sun baked. And it's only if you burn the site down that they, they are preserved for us. So that, that's how we find them. Um, they, these writing was though also used for dedicatory inscriptions. As you see on this vase, um, this is the linear A script and this is a stone vase. Um, and such vases and many others like called offering tables and the like were found at many religious sites. They become very prominent, these religious sites, in the proto-palatial period, especially the well-known peak sanctuaries, also caves, open-air sites that were not peaks but lower down, and some small buildings, even shrines in individual rooms. The peak sanctuaries are the best known and most widespread. They seem to be communal sites, but close inspection of the materials suggests more variations in patterns of activity than used to be thought. Some may have special associations, but in general, there seems to be a different range of ritual offerings between different types of site, and even between examples of the same site. The offerings at peak sanctuaries include Representations of both men and women, uh, ignore though on this slide, this is from the Ashmolean, um, the Ashmolean Museum, uh, that's a much later female figure, but these two male figures are from one of the famous peak sanctuaries, and quite often such male figures have a dagger on, the, um, on their belt. It's a symbol probably of relatively high rank. The women, um, the female uh, figurines, uh, quite often wear a rather elaborate dress and even have headgear. And this raises a question about Minoan society as a whole, which has often been posed. Does the quite exceptional degree of prominence given to female representations in a variety of art forms suggest that Minoan society was dominated by women? Apart from the figurines, the bulk of the evidence belongs to the second palace or neo-palatial period. Much of it, though, seems to be official art on wall frescoes or on seal stones and seal rings of metal that would have been used and worn by very important persons. Often, the female figures are shown performing in a ceremony, sometimes with one very much larger than the rest, who is very likely to be a representation of a deity, therefore. You will perceive how elaborate the dress they are wearing is. I would like to think of this as um, a figure comparable to a famous Near Eastern goddess, generally called Ishtar, who was always attended by two minor goddesses and can be shown like that. But these two on the other side are uh, worshippers doing the reverential um, uh, welcome. This actually does not come from Crete, but it's almost certainly Cretan work. And this extraordinary find, which really, when I saw it first in um, a, a, a seminar in London, took my breath away. This shows a very characteristic scene, a seated female being approached respectfully by, uh, in this case, what seems to be a boy or a very young uh, uh, teenager, older one, and male and female fully grown behind. Some kind of representation. And the fact that we have a female figure, as it were, up in the sky, 
suggest that this woman is actually embodying the manifestation of a goddess. This uh, comes from a site called Moklos, M-O-C-H-L-O-S. And as I say, it's, a, it's an ivory piece and it was the lid of a box. It's absolutely extraordinary. I think such evidence could very well be compatible with worship of a very powerful goddess, or maybe several goddesses, if the settings in which we find these representations can be distinguished. But even if a goddess was at the head of a Minoan pantheon, it does not follow that society, human society was female dominated. Consider classical Athens and the other Greek cities like Argos and even Sparta that had female patron gods, but were eminently patriarchal in their society. It should not be forgotten that there were also um, occasional representations of dominant male figures. Is this some kind of city patron? Anyway, he's portrayed very much in the manner of um, uh, an important young male. He has a necklace and um, boots and all sorts of things that show this. This is a, uh, an example of a ceiling, by the way, which has been, been made by probably an oval bezeled ring. There is no obvious iconography, though, as there is in the whole of the Near Eastern civilizations, of uh, iconography of a male monarch. And I remain attracted by the idea that the societies of these various Minoan centers of power could have been run by a kind of board of office holders who included both males and females with separate responsibilities, all considered important, even vital, to society, or maybe representing different groups within the population. Anyway, some kind of oligarchy. The proto-palatial period shows a notable increase in evidence for Minoan activity outside Crete, both in the Aegean and beyond. But as I've said, the activity in the Aegean falls short, in most cases of demonstrating that any Minoan colonies were established. Rather, most analysis of the material suggests progressive Minoanization from one level to the next, with considerable evidence for the survival of local traditions. There was clearly some contact with local centers further north in the Aegean, including Troy. And on Samothrace, an island in the North Aegean, Minoan style inscribed documents have even been found. But in this region, the much more visible influence is that of mainland Greece, particularly seen in the adoption at Troy of characteristic shapes of the fine gray minion ware, like the goblet that I showed you. This, is, this ware is now identified as a in its um, best form as a central Greek product. And it was popular and locally imitated though in many parts of the mainland and the cyclical. And this returns us to what was happening outside Crete in the Middle Bronze Age. As I've already mentioned, what can be called towns, generally rather small, were established on several islands as far east as Rhodes. But apart from Kalala on Aina, there is nothing of this kind in the Helladic region. The communities were villages, some big, some small. And it has been plausibly suggested that the prevailing ethos was conservative, focused on kin groups, and generally rather egalitarian, opposed to displays of wealth and superior status. Some small groups did try to distinguish themselves or were singled out as special, by being buried in tumuli, but these were not necessarily leaders. Or they might be buried with exotic imported items such as pots or metal items, or have bigger or more complex houses. They might include the men of renown, whose existence has been argued for, who distinguish themselves in some way as hunters, travelers, negotiators with foreigners, even warriors. And these might have become leaders of factions, 
that could play a disruptive role in society. There were certainly contacts with the Aegean on the eastern side of the mainland and in the South Peloponnese, where links with Minoan and Kithara can be detected. But for most of the Middle Bronze Age, these had little traceable influence on mainland development. All of this was the change in the early neopalatial period, by which time there had been considerable changes within Crete's political organization, as many think, though there is disagreement on details. But if ever Knossos controlled at least a considerable part of Crete, it was now. Other major centers like Festos and Malia seem to have dwindled. Palace of Festos was actually destroyed and not rebuilt for a while. And distinctive Knossian features have been traced in the material elsewhere, as also in the Minoan material reaching the Aegean Islands. It's even been suggested there was a supposed re reorganization of the peak sanctuary cults, and they were brought under palace, so Knossian, control. These are areas into which I venture tentatively because there are considerable divisions of opinion still. But it can be said that in the earliest late Bronze Age phase, late Mino and 1A in pottery terms, Crete in general and Knossos in particular seems to have been most flourishing. And this is when towns like this is Gurnia, the center of Gurnia in eastern Crete. And this is most of what has been excavated at, in the far east of Crete at Palacastro showing you a very town-like plan with uh, streets and everything. And um, Knossos's population may by now have reached 40,000. There's a remarkable fact, though, that except at Knossos and Poros to its north and some East Cretan jar ceremonies, cemeteries, sorry, we have extraordinarily little evidence for how the neo-palatial dead were buried. This was not necessarily a period of peace and prosperity under the fabled Minoan phallusocracy, rule of the sea. For there was a new and quite probably disruptive element on the Aegean Sea, the early Mycenaean principalities. At a stage probably early in the Neopalatial period, in various regions of the mainland, certain persons, probably leaders of groups, which have once caused to mind the idea of men of renown and factions, seem to be making themselves rulers of small territories, probably founded by a mixture of petty warfare and negotiation. And a much more hierarchical division of society seems to have been developing. We know these people largely from their burials, often impressive in their shapes, including the Tholos tombs, round planned and domed, which uh, the earliest examples are still mostly known from Messina, but irritatingly, there is a new one near Co Corinth. Also, in the increasingly rich grave goods that were laid with the dead, most often these were burials for, for small groups of persons, apparently, though buried successively. But they show a concern with individuals each being buried with goods that might well include personal possessions as well as items that suit their status. And the same types of goods were favored at several sites, particularly for males. There's little evidence for any comparably impressive buildings, but a pylos, this, these walls underneath have a remarkably similar appearance to the magazine sets that you can find in the Cretan palaces, and the style of architecture associated with them does seem to be Minoan. Also at a site called Mithru in Locris, yeah, there was apparently a an all reorganization of the whole settlement so that the road system led directly to two different elite buildings. So you could have a situation where there was rival, rivalry for leadership in some of these communities. Why this development should have happened now still seems unclear, but increasing Cretan interest in the mainland is probably involved. The shaft graves 
of course, provide the premier example of these new ruling groups and the best evidence of how much wealth they could accumulate. This is a display of just some of the material that was found in grave three. Up at the top, the central burial, who was uh, obviously a very important woman, um, had a crown. This was found on her chest, but not these. They may have been part of her dress otherwise. And these ornaments were probably on the shroud maybe that wrapped her or possibly um, robes that she wore in life. And you can see other things such as a dress pin and, and earrings and so forth. This, sorry, I've lost myself. Um, it remains a problem where, just what the source of this sudden wealth was. It seems possible to me that some could have come from the great powers of Crete, maybe also the lesser powers of the Aegean towns, in the form of diplomatic presence or friendship gifts. They include whole sets of massive copper vessels that were being used for cooking and uh, distributing uh, food at feasts, many smaller vases of gold and silver. This extraordinary vase is almost certainly my known manufacture, and it is of electrum, the mixture of gold and silver, but it has gold inlays and niello, a form of enamel, um, used in exactly the same way as the famous daggers, like the Lanhan dagger and so forth, that you will see many illustrations on. Probably at least also some of the fine swords that were so common in the, with the male burials. This type, Taipei, was brought to its perfection in Crete. And this type B, first found in the shaft base, probably made by local smiths as an improvement on the Taipei shape, which had to be um, riveted to a separate handle. In fact, craft specialists may have been sent from Crete to Mycenae. You may well ask why these new and probably uncivilized seeming rulers should have been receiving diplomatic, diplomatic presents. One reason may be the same as that used by the Roman and Chinese empires in later times in dealing with potentially dangerous neighbors. To make friends and allies of them, and so, you hope, keep them from raiding your territories. If there ever was a warlike ethos prevalent on the mainland, it could have been now, when warfare may often have been used to establish these new principalities. Warfare and raiding may in fact have been recurrent problems in the Aegean, where some towns already had established fortifications. This is Aia Arini on Kea. And warrior burials, men buried, buried with weapons and often indications of high rank can be found even in northern Crete. We hear from a later Hittite text of Anatolian princes setting out to raid Cyprus. So this may, they may well have been active in the Aegean too, and the new mainland rulers may have been similarly tempted to increase their wealth either by raiding or by getting a payment not to raid. I think there's more to it, though. And that early Mycenaean connections with the North Aegean and also appearing at this very time with the Lipari Islands, north of Sicily and of Ischia, further up the coast, where both Peloponnesian and Central Greek fine pottery have been found, reflect the activity of mainland originating traders linking up with European trading systems, but along which copper and tin, for example, tin being very rare, always, um, could have traveled. Local rulers could ensure that these goods were passed on into the established Aegean and East Mediterranean trading systems, and also maybe guarantee the safety of any Aegean, Cypriot or Syrian traders that might venture so far, as they certainly did later, for a consideration, of course. 
just as central Anatolian rulers exacted payment for the passage of Assyrian traders through their territories in the 20th and 19th centuries BC. That such connections existed and were valued at the European end is further suggested by the appearance of Baltic amber at this time, mostly in the form of necklaces of European style. There were surely a kind of friendship gifts. These appear at Mycenae, several sites in Messenia, including Pylos, and occasionally elsewhere. There's even a little from Mithru, where there's an extraordinary evidence of link with um, Europe, a horse bridle piece of an unusual type with Carpatho-Danubian connections. The mainland in trading could supply more prosaic trade items such as food surpluses, which might be useful for the largest Cretan settlements, and exotic items like the hides and pelts, horns and teeth of wild animals, none of which were native to Crete at all, unlikely to be found on many islands either. The material for the obviously much valued bull's tusk plated helmets could have come from the mainland and perhaps even live specimens of various animals. I know of the suggestion that cattle derived from the native aurochs stock on the mainland were imported to Crete to improve the native breed. That there was very lively exchange within the Aegean involving the new mainland principalities is evident from the distrib distribution of vessels, principally drinking cups, of the new Mycenaean decorated pottery, also though in smaller quantities of the jug and jar shapes that were popular products of the mainland polychrome style that seems to be native to Boeotia. Both are well represented in the strata of Aeorini on Caea, have been found, especially the Mycenaean, in the latest town levels at Akrotiri on Thera, which you see. And this brings me to the point where I shall end this first paper with the eruption of a volcano that has preserved so many impressive buildings and the frescoes that decorated their walls. This is the Saffron Gatherer's fresco. And one interesting feature of it, apart from the very elaborate dress that the gatherers are uh, wearing, uh, saffron, by the way, is a very valuable commodity at this time. The earrings that this girl is wearing are exactly paralleled by a, a pair in grave three of the shaft graves. Um, and another sections from the famous ship fresco in West Room, House Room 5 um, as a reminder of the continuing importance of maritime connections. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.